Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. It's good to see you guys. Welcome to Northland. I know people are still kind of filing in, but we're going to get right into some announcements and then we will get right to worship. Hey, real quick, a quick housekeeping thing and a thank you. If you're a parent of a kiddo of, of a kiddo in our North Kids ministry, thank you for being patient and understanding as we are expanding the kids area. We know there's been some jostling around of how you check your kids in, how you check them out. Uh, you can't use the patio, but thank you for being understanding. This is one of those things where it's going to get worse before it gets better, but when it gets better, it's going to be really really good. And so just a reminder, the, the patio is inaccessible. So when you leave here, if you're going to pick up your kiddos, walk out of this room, make a right, and you'll go into our North Auditorium and we'll have volunteers there and they'll help you get your kiddos checked out. But again, thank you guys for being flexible and understanding. We're not sure yet time-wise of how long that patio is going to be inaccessible. There are some really exciting things happening out there. They're doing frost lines or taking down the canopy. Um, but that being said, we will keep you updated to the best of our ability so that you understand the process every Sunday morning. Uh, you know what to do with your kids, what it's going to look like before service, after service. But again, thank you for being understanding and being flexible. There's there's just a lot going on over there and it's going to get really, really good. We're just in the messy phase right now. So thank you guys. Um, again, a few quick announcements. If you have a student in our refuge student ministry, that's going to be grade six through 12. The refuge ski trip is coming up very quickly. It's going to be December 27th through the 29th. They're heading up to Ames, Iowa. The cost is $195 a person. They would love for your students to be a part of it. It's probably going to be like 50 or 60 degrees that day. So they may just be going down on grass, but hey, they're going to go and they're going to have fun. Again, it's going to be the 27th through the 29th. The cost is $195 per student. It's a great opportunity for your students to get together with other students in the ministry and just kind of celebrate the Christmas season, have some fun skiing. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, I'll tell you, you can get signed up in just a moment. We've had a lot of questions about Christmas Eve services, the weekend of what we're doing this Wednesday. And so I want to take a minute and just clarify a few things for you. Number one, Christmas Eve, the 24th on Friday, we will have five services. 1 o'clock, 2.15, 3.30, 4.45, and 6 p.m. Uh, the reason we're doing that, people are going, why are we having five? Why can't we just do three like we normally do? Here's why. Christmas and Easter, historically, are the most well-attended services at a church. So we've got a number of people that are going to be coming in. And if you come to this service or the second service, you know it gets pretty tight, pretty packed. So add extra people. Then on top of that, because we want the Christmas season to just be really intentional and purposeful with your family, we have the kids come in and worship with us. We have an interactive service that makes it engaging for them so that they don't sit and just go, mommy, our service done. What are we doing for lunch? We got to go. We got to go. And so that being said, we won't have kids service that day. So we're going to have anywhere between 150 and 200 kids in service with us. And so when you do that and you add them to three already pretty packed services, it gets real uncomfortable real quick. And so we're spreading it out. We'll have five services again, one, two, 15, three, 30, four, 45, and six. Now, that night, you can pick up the Christmas boxes. We've been talking about these Christmas boxes. What we're doing is the 26th, which is that Sunday, we will not have in-person services. So I need you guys to hear that. The 26th, we will not have in-person services. So if you show up to church on the 26th, unless you brought your family with you, you'll be alone. We won't be here. Okay, we want you to take that day and just be really intentional and purposeful with your family. Now, what we will have, because we don't want to just leave you out there, we're putting together essentially an online service that we'll be showing on the 26th at 10 a.m. So you can tune into our YouTube channel, you can tune into our Facebook page, and we will be streaming a service at 10 a.m. on the 26th. There'll be worship, there'll be a teaching time. And on top of that, we're putting together the boxes. Now, the, the Christmas boxes, we're gonna be handing out on Christmas Eve. There's gonna be a box per family, or if you're an individual, you can take a box. There's gonna be an activity in there, there's gonna be a devotional in there. We want you to take that, sit down with your family, sit down by yourself, walk through that activity. And then there's a challenge for you to take it and go from there. And so we want you to do that. Now, that being said, this Wednesday, this Wednesday, we're going to get together as a church family and we're going to be stuffing those boxes. Between the two campuses, we're putting together like 650 of these boxes. And there's things like cookie mix, cookie cutters, frosting, sprinkles, devotionals, tissue paper, just a lot that's going into this box. And so we want to work together and just knock this out. And so this Wednesday, from 6 to 7.30 p.m., we're going to be right out in our commons, out in our lobby. We're going to have Christmas music playing. We'll have hot chocolate available. Uh, we're just going to get together and just kind of celebrate one last time before the Christmas season, put these together, and just get ready to minister to people on a large scale. And so we would love for you to be a part of that. Our Christmas Eve services, I, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but five services is a lot. If you're, if you're staff at a church, you just know you're signing up for Christmas and Easter. It's just going to be crazy for you, and you'll see your family when you see them. But when you're volunteers, that sacrifices a lot. And we have such an incredible great group, an incredible group of volunteers, from our worship team to our tech team to our greeters to our, our deacons, our women's ministry, men's ministry, across the board, just incredible volunteers. But 
five services is a lot to ask them. So if you're sitting in this room and you've been thinking, man, I really need to get connected. I don't really know what first step to take. Let this be a first step. Come and serve with us on Christmas Eve, whether it's a service or two services. Maybe you can just stand out in the comments and you can shake hands or give somebody a fist bump or give them a wave and just welcome them and be a smiling face. Maybe you're sitting in this room and you have a side-by-side or a golf cart and you wanna help with the parking lot team as we shuttle people in because the parking lot's gonna be packed because it always is on Christmas. Let us know. You can stop by our Connect Corner right out in the comments. Talk to Jimmy Combs. He's our assimilation pastor. He's the one that arranges all of our volunteers for the, the greeting, for the parking lot, all that. We would love to put you guys in service. It's a great way to get connected and just meet other people as well as serve in a really cool way. So no matter what you do, know that today, man, we're so excited that you guys are here to worship with us. We're going to have a great morning of worship, but first, would you guys do me a favor? Would you stand, turn, wave to somebody? Welcome to North Road.
children weep no more hope is on the horizon we Messiah Angels let your song begin Here comes heaven Christ is born in Bethlehem Here comes heaven
nothing that compares to the power of your name. There's no one that compares to your goodness. Jesus, there's nothing else that's worth worshiping because you came here for me, because you silenced the boast of sin and grave. Church, that's who's worth worshiping now. Come on, lift your voices. Death could not hold you. The veil told me for you. You silenced the ghost of sin and grave. The heavens are holy. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name. Oh, it's what we say. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Be one. God alone. Praise the Church, this is the gospel message of our Savior. This is why you came. worshiping this morning and enter into a time of offering. And I want to remind you that if you came today prepared to give in person, we want to give that opportunity. And so we've got a few back cuts set up at the back of the room. Um, if you want to take advantage of online giving, uh, you can do that as well through our church center app or through our website. Um, for a moment, would you pray with me? God, we come to you this morning just with hearts of expectation, uh, not that we would have some sort of agenda fulfilled or that we would check some sort of box on our list, but God, that you would be worshiped this morning. God, I pray in this moment you would just allow us to be still. 
that you would silence the noise. That whatever baggage we walked in here with, whatever busyness we're consumed with, God, you would just silence it for a moment. You would take that baggage. God, I pray that in these next few moments, you would allow us to hear exactly what you have for us, God, that you would begin performing this incredible spiritual surgery that needs to be done, God, though it may be painful, it's necessary. God, I pray that we would worship you. We'd fully worship you, not just in song, but in the way that we love, in the way we give, in the way that we serve. God, in the way we hear the word and let it just envelop every part of who we are and shape who we are as we go from here. God, more than anything, be worshiped this morning because you are worthy. May your name be magnified. May you be glorified. God, we worship you. God, it's in your name we pray. Amen. The story of Christmas. No, not Ralph and the baby gun. Not Walter Hobbs. You don't get that. Not angels getting wings or homework. Now, don't get me wrong, those are great stories. We all love a good laugh at having it. But all of that just distracts and detracts and subtracts from the unlikely story of an unlikely ending, an unlikely cast, and an unlikely beginning. How unlikely that it would be prophesied by multiple authors separated by hundreds of years with incredible accuracy when the Messiah would appear. How unlikely that a virgin would conceive or that her husband to be would actually believe that his baby was from God. Most men would just leave him. How unlikely that a carpenter's son, not a prince or a king or a fortunate one, would be revealed by his cousin who is God's own son. It's pretty unlikely to be perfectly honest, virtually impossible if you were to ask a scientist, but it really happened 2,000 years ago. The son of God came to rescue our souls. You may struggle to believe that it's all true, is a God that actually loves you. But the unlikely story of Christmas season is proof that God loves you more than the other dear on your roof. Well, good morning. It's been a while since we spoke last. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Some of you are still waking up. I get it. Well, it is great to be with you guys this morning. Um, we are continuing our walk through Unlikely, which is our Christmas series. And we've been talking about a number of things over the last several weeks. You know, we've talked about the relationship of, of Joseph and Mary and just kind of the cultural context of what was going on at the time. We talked about uh, the probability. You know, we talked about numbers last week. When Greg was here, he talked about uh, just the, the statistical probability of Jesus fulfilling the prophecies and just how mind-blowing that was. And, and today I want to talk about something um, that I think will hit home for a lot of us. And when you first hear it, you, mo- you may go, well, that, what does that have to do with Christmas? Like, can't we talk about the star and the, the journey and the baby? Which we will, you know, on Christmas Eve. But today we're going to talk about something a little different. And before we get into any of that, um, the reason that I'm here with you today and Matt is not, because the original plan was that Matt was going to be preaching. Um, so there is, they had some sort of virus that went through their house this week. Their kids had it, and then Matt got it yesterday. And so he called me late last night, and he's like, listen, I'm not going to be able to go. I need you to go. But on top of that, um, and we're going to pray for this in just a moment, um, Matt's dad is currently in the hospital. Um, he's got congestive heart failure, um, and it's, it's very, very, very touch and go. Um, it's not looking great, um, but, but we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but Matt, Matt got a hold of me before first service and said um, that they had just put his dad on a vent. And so um, if you know Matt and you know his dad, the relationship that they have is just, it, it's crazy how close they are. I mean, Matt's dad is his best friend. He's his hero. Um, and so this is really tough on him because, of course, anytime you go through something like this, it's tough. But then he's also sick, so he can't be there in the hospital with him. And so he's desperately wanting to be there with him because they don't know what's going to happen. And they've had a lot of really good conversations over the phone. But as you know, um, being on the phone and being in person is not the same thing. And so uh, before we get into any of the message and any of that, I just think as the church, we just need to pray. You know, there's great, great assurance of Matt's dad's relationship with Christ. And, and he's just, if you know him, one of the godliest men you will ever meet. Um, but there's still incredible heartbreak and uncertainty around the situation. And so um, for a moment, would you guys pray with me? God, in this moment, we're just trusting in you. God, there's so much uncertainty, so much that we don't know of. 
And God, it's in these moments that the only thing we can do is lean into you. God, we take great, just incredible joy in the fact that Chuck has just this incredibly intimate relationship with you. But God, I also know that right now there's hurting, there's heartbreak, there's disappointment, there's frustration. And God, I, I pray that you would just bring just incredible peace to the situation. God, your word is clear that you are close to the brokenhearted. You save the crushed in spirit. And I know Matt and his brothers and their families are just brokenhearted in this moment. Their spirits are crushed, God, and they're walking this line of rejoicing because they know the godly man that their dad has been, but then also heartbroken because things just aren't looking good. But God, here's what I know is that you are faithful and you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so God, in this moment, I pray that no matter what happens in, in the coming minutes, hours, days, whatever it may be, God, I pray that you would be glorified, that there would be testimony that comes from this, God, that you would give such sweet time for Matt and his brothers and his mom and his dad, and God, as they walk through this with uncertainty, I pray the one thing that they would know for certain is that you are who you say you are. God, as the church, I pray that we would be the hands and feet. Whatever that looks like practically, God, I pray that we would be just that. God, that we would walk through this together. We would bear one another's burdens, that God, we would we would be there to, to edify and to encourage and to build up. My God, more than anything, I pray this knowing it, trusting it, and having absolute confidence in it that, that you would be glorified through this. God, we're desperate for you to respond. Do so in a way that, that brings glory to you, God. We pray it in your name. Amen. You know, darkness and silence are interesting things. When it's dark, there's uncertainty. When it's dark, there's a lack of direction. It's the unknown. It's why one minute during the day, you can go down in your basement and you can walk upstairs perfectly fine, but the minute it gets dark outside, you sprint up the stairs like someone's chasing you. Silence. For a lot of us, it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Some of you, you might be wired like me. I love the silence. When you meet with enough people and you counsel with enough people, you know the healing and the transformation that happens during that silence. When someone sits and they think and they contemplate about the struggle and the things they're going through, and there's no words, and it's just silence. For others of you, you may be wired like my wife. My wife is wired the complete opposite of me. The silence is terrifying. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. And so if there's silence, we're going to replace that silence with words or actions with something just to make it not awkward. But there's just something interesting about silence and darkness. Because when you're in the dark, you don't know where you're going. You lack wisdom. You lack clarity. You lack direction. You lack certainty. And see, there was this period of time of about 400 years in Scripture. It's called the intertestamental period where things were just dark and things were silent. No one heard from God. There were no words of prophecy. It was just silence. This is 400 years of frustration, of confusion, of disappointment, of uncertainty, of darkness. And then, then, with the birth of John the Baptist, there's this glimmer of hope. And it's really the first glimpse of light in 400 years. And he comes into the picture, and, and I'm, we're going to talk about it in just a moment, but he comes into the picture, and there's hope. Not hope in him but hope in the one who gave him the call. And so who was John? John was born to a priest named Zechariah. His mother was Elizabeth. And John, as we're going to read in just a moment, was a huge surprise in a situation where his birth was highly unlikely. And he literally, his birth literally took the words right out of his father's mouth. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 1, verses 9 through 24. It'll be up on the screens. It'll be up on the TV if you don't have it. Luke chapter 1, verses 9 through 24. And here's what it says. It's talking about Zechariah. But it says, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. 
And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Verse 12. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, verse 17, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in a years. If there's ever been a husband trained to not call his wife old, it was right there. (laughs) Verse 19, and the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Verse 21. And the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. Verse 24. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months, she kept herself hidden. Now, get a picture of what's going on here. So John is coming into the picture in a very unlikely manner. We've been talking about unlikely events this whole series, right? And so he's got these parents who are are old, very old, and barren. And so it doesn't seem very likely that they would have a child. But this angel comes and says, listen, you're going to have this son. I want you to name him John. He's going to do incredible things for the Lord. People are going to turn their ways and they're going to follow him because of what your son does and his obedience and and Zechariah says, no, I don't think you understand. My wife, she's, she's, she's seasoned, right? She's seasoned. I'm very old. This doesn't make any sense. And they go, no, 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 listen, this is going to happen because it's from the Lord. And because you doubted, until he's born, you're not going to say a word. And he walks out, and of course, he's mute, and he's giving them the people signs. And I'm like, well, I don't know what you're saying. Like, say words. And he doesn't want to say any words. And so he goes, and then eventually, they have the baby. It's extremely unlikely. You look at the circumstances, you're like, that doesn't make any sense. She was barren, they're old, and then they have a baby. And of course, if you know any sort of biblical history, you know that John and Jesus were born around the same time. John is about six to eight months older than Jesus. And so there's a, there's a passage where they go and, and John leaps in the womb, and it's a, it's a really cool picture. But um, as you can see, John is in the, the, his mother's womb at approximately the same time Mary was pregnant with Jesus, kind of towards the end, and, and Jesus was kind of towards the beginning. So prior to Jesus becoming the chief priest the chief prophet, the chief king. Israel was kind of set up in this way. They functioned this way. The king ruled you. The priest went to God on your behalf. And the prophet was the voice of God warning and challenging you. Now, before we move any further, I want to remind you, this is coming on the heels of there being silence from God for 400 years. Silence. For 400 years. John the Baptist would be essentially the last Old Testament type prophet before the birth of Christ. And so here he is, he's in his mother's womb, he's ready to come, he's ready to grow, he's ready to become the forerunner of Christ, as we're going to see. And at this point, you're probably wondering, why in the world, a week before Christmas, are we talking about John the Baptist? Why aren't we talking about the star? Why aren't we talking about the journey? Can I hear about the shepherds? Just tell me something. There's a reason why we're talking about it. The reason John is in the Christmas story and why we're talking about it the week before Christmas is because he came to tell people of Jesus and his coming. And not only that, but also to bring further evidence of how unlikely and yet how sure this Christmas story truly is. Turn with me to John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. John chapter 1, verses 19 through 34. It says this, and this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Verse 22, they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And I want you to just... Hold on to that, file it in the little system. We're going to come back to it in just a moment. But just remember that. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Okay? Verse 24. 
Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am, un- I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Verse 32. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this, this is the son of God. Now, Let's go back so that we kind of understand and get a holistic picture of what's happening here. Okay, so John is doing these works. At this point, he's grown up. He's, he's starting to do incredible things for God, and people are coming to him going, listen, there's been 400 years of silence, and this guy's coming. He's talking about God. He's doing these incredible things. He's baptizing people. Like, are you, you're, 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 you're the guy. You've got to be the guy. Are you the guy? Are you the Christ? And it's like, no, 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 that's, that's not me. That's not me. Well, are you Elijah? Because, I mean, you're doing some crazy thing. No, that's not me. Well, are you the prophet? No, that's, that's not me. And so he turns and he looks and here comes Jesus walking down. He goes, okay, listen, you're looking for the guy. That's the guy. He's the reason I'm here. Everything I'm doing is because of him. He's the guy you're looking for. He's the one. And it's, it's interesting because just as, just as we talked about, or we will talk about at Christmas Eve, when we talk about, that's when we'll talk about Jesus being born in the manger and the trough and all these things. Jesus came in such an unlikely manner, right? Born with with no fanfare, with no pomp, with no circumstance, completely countercultural to what people expected the Messiah to look like. And John, similarly, on the surface, looked to be the furthest thing from the forerunner for the Messiah. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. And as you're turning there, you know, I think Scripture is interesting. It's very interesting. And I think there are times when we read something and we just gloss over it, right? And we don't really think about just how some of it just rests, right? There's just some things you read and you go, that's just like, that, that seems odd. Not odd like it didn't happen, but odd like that's a little bit weird. Matthew chapter three, verse four. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. Not weird, typical prophet wear the same thing, right? Camel's hair, a leather belt around his waist. Then it gets a little bit odd. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Like not meat, not vegetables, just some locusts and wild honey. I want you to get the picture, okay? When I start saying these things, you're gonna know what we're talking about. So this is a man who lives in the woods, okay? He's wearing camel's hair. He's got a leather belt around his waist. He eats locusts, eats honey. He essentially went off the grid before going off the grid was cool. You know what I mean? And so you see this guy and you go, this guy, he's just, he's nothing. He's a nobody. But in reality, he's the forerunner for Christ, right? He's the one that's gonna tell people. He's the one that's bringing a voice to the silence, And so he's this really unlikely man who had a really unlikely birth to tell about another unlikely man who had an unlikely birth. And so I don't want you to to miss this, okay? I don't want you to miss what God is doing through him. As they're talking about it, he he wears the the camel's hair, he's got the leather belt, and people think that 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 might be Elijah. That's why, because Elijah was a prophet and, and they look similar. And that's why they ask him, hey, are you the prophet? So they ask him, are you the Messiah? No. Okay, well, are you Elijah? Well, no. Are you the prophet? Well, no. Like he says all these things and he's, he's trying to point people to God and he does this incredible job of really deflecting, right? Which we'll talk about in just a moment. Now, go back. Remember the thing I told you to file away? Well, now we're gonna open the file cabinet. We're gonna pull that back out. It talks about a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 40, verse three. Love the way scripture ties itself together. Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, a voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Does that sound familiar? It's so cool to see scripture tie up loose ends. Man, I I love it. But that's exactly what John was. He came to be a voice. You see, darkness is interesting. In darkness, there's desperation. In darkness, there's desolation. In darkness, there's isolation. And John came as this incredible voice for the one who brings completion and perfection and light to the darkness. One of the most amazing statements that I think that John makes, and he makes so many incredible statements throughout scripture, one of the most amazing statements that he makes is in Luke chapter three, verses 15 and 16. Luke chapter three, 
verses 15 and 16. As the people were in expectation, all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So I want to explain what's going on here. So there's people standing around. They're seeing what's happening. Again, they're asking the question, like, he's got to be the Christ. Like, he's doing these things. We haven't heard from God in 400 years. Like, this has got to be the guy. And he says, no, I don't think you understand. The guy that's coming, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Now, don't miss the context of what he's talking about here. This isn't like today, where if you're going to go somewhere, you just pull up your Uber app, and you're like, listen, I need to get an Uber. The guy comes, you're like, are you Mark? He's like, yeah, well, I'm John. I think you're my guy. And then we go and we drive. No, this is, you're walking down just, just dusty, dirty roads. If there's horses or camels or donkeys, you know, they leave stuff behind in the road. They don't go to the side. There's no scoopers. They just leave it in the road. So they're walking through it. So feet get dirty. They wear sandals. They walk everywhere. It's why, why washing feet was a thing culturally. Today, it doesn't make sense, right? I still think the symbolism is incredible when people do that. But I think back then, the cultural context made sense where people were washing feet. And so in that day, what would happen was if there's a master who had a slave, he'd been walking all day, he's been, his feet are disgusting, they're dirty. He comes to a place where he's got to go inside. And so the slave would get down on the ground, unstrap the sandals, wash the feet, and he would walk in. And so what John is saying is, listen, you guys are asking me if I'm the Messiah. You're asking me if I'm the prophet. You're asking me if I'm Elijah. I'm none of those things. I'm not even worthy to be called a slave in the context of Christ. And I just think it's, it's incredible because it's so countercultural to how we live, right? We live, I, I like to call it the Uncle Rico culture, but raise your hand if you've seen Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, I'm so proud of you, North Road. Uncle Rico, right? Bet you I can throw this football over that mountain range, right? Coach would have put me in in the fourth quarter. We'd have won state championship, no doubt, no doubt in my mind, right? We live in a one-upper society. But some of you may be sitting in this room and you have people in your life that the minute I say one-upper, you go, oh, I know the guy. I, I go up to the guy and I say, listen, I can't believe it. My kid, we switched schools and she finally got her first B and he's like, I know what you mean. My kid's been getting straight A's since kindergarten, Right? Oh, man, we bought this new house. Like, it just fits our family so perfect. We've been grinding. We, we finally, I said, I know what you mean, my house. It's small. It's modest. It's 5,000 square, square feet. We were going to downsize, but why would we do that? Right? The guy that just, the one-upper. That's the society we live in. Because we live in this perpetual cycle of just puffing out our chest and going, listen, I'm not just going to keep up with the Joneses. I'm going to blow past them. Right? And John was like the antithesis of this. Now, I'm going to say some things here. And because it's Christmas season, this is going to strike a chord with some people. And this is not a personal attack because let me preface it by saying this. The first thing I'm going to say, our Grammy does this. And she does it because she wants to keep people updated about how many grandkids she has, great grandkids, how things are going. But these are things we do, right? These are things we do in, in, and we do them and it ends up puffing chest. This is not a personal attack. Please don't send me emails or write letters. Number one, we send brag letters at Christmas. Ooh, that one struck a chord. Right? We say, hey, here's what's going on. Look at this, look at this, look at this. We share sports stories. Man, listen, our team, we were pretty good. Like I hit like 300, it was great. Oh, I know what you mean, we won state and then I went to college and I played some semi-pro ball, but it was no big deal, right? Everybody does that, right? We share fishing stories. Why do you think we hold the fish a little bit closer to the camera? <laughs> Why is it every time we tell the story, the fight got a little bit harder and the fish got a little bit bigger, right? We share job stories. Oh man, I got this raise. It's like, I know what you mean. They just made me VP. Right? Turn on any football game, right? Turn on any NFL game. And what do they say at the end of the game? They're like, man, first and foremost, glory to God. Listen, it's been a grind. I've been working so hard, but I feel like I finally got my dues. And we, we go, man, give glory to God. But, but listen, it's been a grind. I've been working so hard, and I feel like I finally got what I deserved. And it's like this flippant glory thing, right? Why? Because we've got this desire to puff out our chest. Listen, I get it. I've got two older brothers, which means I just have this incessant desire to be right, right? It's just, if, you're, if you're the youngest of multiples, you know what I'm talking about, because most of the time you are right, right? But I'm a... I say it because I'm up here and they're not. Listen, I am very much a facts guy, right? If you've ever gotten into any sort of debate or argument with me, you know that I just, I just immediately go to facts. Why? Because facts are black and white. You can't argue facts, right? When you have facts, there's truth, right? So in me, in me, there is a desire to subconsciously puff out my chest because I need to be right, right? John had none of that, none of it. 
Think about it. For 400 years, there's been silence. He's the first person to come and say, hey, by the way, I got this message from God. Look at all these amazing things that are happening. And he has this opportunity because people are asking him. They're like, man, you're the, you're the Messiah, right? You're the Christ. You're, the, you're Elijah. You're the prophet. And he's like, no, 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 no. And he's got this opportunity to go, you know, maybe they're right. Like, I'm pretty cool. I'm a big deal. Right? Because we get this opportunity to do it. And we go, listen, yeah, you know, you're right. God, and we, we do it under this guise. God's just empowered me to do incredible things. I don't know. Glory to God. And you laugh. Listen, even as pastors, we do it. We get in a group with other pastors and we start talking about our church and how things are going. We go, and one guy goes, yeah, you know, our church, we're running like a thousand. It's been a crazy, the growth. I'm like, yeah, you know, any Sunday we've got like anywhere from 700 to 1500 people. I don't know. It's a thing. You know, church is going good. Why? Because we've got this just incredible, insatiable desire to be enough. And John, John understood that being enough meant following Christ. Nothing more. Nothing more. He understood that not only was he beneath the, he was, he was further beneath him than a slave and said, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. All these things you see me doing, it's not me, it's God. I only do it because he's enabled me to. He does it despite me standing in the way. It's the same humility that he echoes in John chapter three and one of probably my top three favorite verses in all of scripture. John chapter three, verse, verses 27 through 30. And it says this. Well, let me give you the context first. Jesus and the disciples are in Judea. There are people getting baptized left and right. And so there's, there's this conversation that pops up and they're talking about the idea of purification and what it takes to be purified and all these things. And, and these people see people going to Jesus. And, and for 400 years, there was silence. And they see John baptizing. They see the work that's being done. And then they go, well, wait a minute. Why are they going to that guy instead of you? Like, you're the guy, right? Like, you're the guy. Why are they going to him? And then we get to verse 27. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I told you, I don't know why we're having this conversation. I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Before we get to 30, I don't want you to miss what he just said. Keep in mind, 400 years of silence, he comes. Unlikely birth, unlikely life is a voice to 400 years of silence. Does amazing things, incredible things. People are getting baptized left and right. People are asking him, are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? Right? And this is what he says. Until this moment, when Christ began his work, my joy has not been complete. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Not because of accolades, not because of things I've done, but because, because God is present. My joy is only complete when God is present. The world will leave you empty and void. Accolades will leave you empty and void. Accomplishments will leave you empty and void. Apart from Christ. And then he says, John 3.30, which I think needs to be a mantra for every one of us who follows Christ. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. After everything, 400 years of silence, being a voice, baptizing people, spreading the word, he says, I don't need to be any of this. I have to decrease. Not he should, not it'd be great. It's he must, he must increase because he understood he understood that in order to have complete joy, in order to have freedom, in order to experience intimacy with the Father for all of eternity, that he must increase and I must decrease. Simple as that. Because there's no room for stories. There's no room for tall tales. There's no room for puffing out our chest. Just truth, unlikely, but sure and certain truth, which is that there is freedom found in the Father. Darkness is an interesting thing. Silence is an interesting thing. And I think for some of us, if I were to ask you this question, I know what the answer would be. Do you feel like God has been silent in your life? Do you feel like you're existing in darkness? Because here's what I know. Several months ago, I had a conversation with somebody within the church and they, were, they had gone through some struggles and then had gotten on the other side of it and were experiencing freedom from it for the first time in their life. And they, they made this statement. They said, I never knew life could exist outside of the pit. 
Because I think for some of us, we live in the darkness for so long, whether it's because of our own choices, whether it's because somebody chose to do something to us, whether it's because of how we were raised, we just think that this is all it is. And I can't exist outside of the pit. The darkness is where I reside. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Scripture is abundantly clear that in him there is no darkness. He is light. And so I say that to tell you this. If you're sitting in this room and you feel like you are a million miles away from God and you're in the darkest point in your life and you feel like it's silent, you feel like you're going through your own 400 years of silence, he has a voice that is offering up to you in this moment freedom. And life can exist outside of the pit. Listen, God didn't send his son to the earth to endure torture, to be brutally murdered on a cross, to be laughed at, to be spit on, to be mocked, so that we could sit and wallow and stay in the pit. He is the one that reaches the hand down and pulls us out of the pit. There's no amount of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps that will pull you out of the darkness. All you'll do is go from one pit to another. It is his grace and his compassion and his mercy and his sacrifice that pulls us out of the pit. And so in this moment, I, I want to take a moment and I want to pray for you because I just feel like there are people sitting in this room who who are believing the lies that darkness is the only thing they will ever know. For whatever reason, maybe it's loss that you've experienced, maybe it's pain that you've experienced, it's heartbreak that you've experienced, it's lies that you've begun to believe. You just think that darkness is the only way that you exist and God could never have anything to do with you. That is a lie from the pits of hell. He has freedom for you. He has light. And it's understanding that like John, we humble ourselves Allow him to increase and us to decrease. We fall on our face before him. We cry out to him. We confess his name. We repent. We turn from our ways and we follow him with everything that we have. He is the one that does the drawing. There's no amount of good works you can do to tip the scales in your favor. There's no amount of effort you can put into it. It's simply understanding that he is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through the Son. And so would you guys do me a favor? Would you bow your head and close your eyes with no one looking around? I think there's so many people sitting in this room who are in the dark. And you're just tired. Listen, I get it. Living in the dark is exhausting. It's uncertain. There's desperation. There's isolation. Sin thrives in isolation. And you're just tired of it. You're tired of living in the dark. You're tired of feeling alone. You're tired of feeling like no one understands what you're going through. If there's anyone who understands what it means to experience pain and loss, it's God. As he watched his son die on a cross. And so if you're sitting in this room and you're just living in darkness, whether you have a relationship with God or you don't have a relationship with God, and you find yourself living in the darkness and you're just tired of it and you want to move on, you want to understand what it means to have freedom and you want to experience the light and you don't want to reside in the pit, would you do me a favor with no one looking around? Would you just raise your hands so I can pray for you? There are hands all over the room. I think even in this moment, there are people who are sitting in the dark and even right now are believing the lie that they can exist outside of the pit. You can exist outside of the pit. God designed you to reside outside of the dark and in the light. You can't be a light of the world if you're sitting in darkness. There's freedom that can only be found in him. God, I pray for the people sitting in this room who raise their hands. And God, I pray for the people in, the, in this room who even now are, are feeling the urge to raise their hand. But even, even now, Satan is speaking lies to them and telling them that they'll never be anything more than they are right now, which is sitting in the dark, alone and isolated. God, I pray that you would silence that and remind them that they were fearfully and wonderfully made, perfect in your image, God, that, that though we sin because of your grace, your mercy, your compassion, your sacrifice, we can understand what it means to experience eternity with you. God, I pray that you would give us freedom. You would pull us out of the pit for the people in here who are, who are in darkness and making a bold claim that they're done with the darkness, God, that don't have a relationship with you. God, I pray that you would meet them where they're at, that they would confess their sin, they would repent, they would cry out your name, and they would understand true freedom. God, may we not exist in the darkness. May we be light everywhere we go. 
And God, more than anything, may we be a church full of people who freely admit that it is imperative, it is essential, it is vital to our life that we decrease and you increase. God, we worship you wholeheartedly, understanding that you are the one and that we are so unworthy to even untie your sandals, God, but because of your grace, your mercy, and your compassion, we even have the opportunity to sit at the table. And God, for that, we're grateful. Be worshiped, God, I pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand. I want to leave you with this, and it's just three quick scriptures. John 8, 12 says this. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, 
but will have the light of life. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And Ephesians 5, 8, which I think is a call and a charge to every one of us as we go from this place. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Listen, as a church, it's easy. It's so easy in the Christmas season. Just get bogged down with the busyness, with the craziness, with the hectic schedules, with trying to get a thousand places and, and doing all these different things. But I think if we take an intentional and purposeful walk through the season and we do exactly what it just said, that though we were darkness, notice it doesn't say we were in darkness. It says we were darkness. Now we are light in the Lord. And so as you go, walk, walk as children of light in whom there is no darkness. And so church, as you go, do just that. Let's not live and rest in the dark. Let's walk as if we were children of light. Have a great week. We'll see you next one at North Road.